when I was four years old, I was in nursery school, and I went to this nursery school that had this big backyard with lots of toys to play on. But there was one toy that everybody wanted in particular. It was this tricycle, and it allowed you to go really, really fast. Um, and there was one little boy who had control over this tricycle. Um, and in order to get a turn, you had to ask him. So one day, I actually got up the courage and I asked him for a turn on this tricycle. And he said to me, not yes or no or anything like that. He just said, you're fat. And I cried because I knew even then that being called fat and being fat was one of the worst things that you could possibly be. So I went home that day and I talked to my mom and I told her what had happened. And she said to me, well, maybe we can go on a diet. And then maybe kids won't make fun of you for being fat. And she said this out of love and being a loving, caring mom and being someone who had lived through the same kind of thing, who had been called fat her whole life and had used uh, weight loss techniques to try to mitigate that. And it sounded like a great idea to me. I would go on this diet. Um, it seemed like a really grown-up thing to do. My mom was always on a diet. Her friends were always on a diet. Um, and maybe I'd get out of the social stigma of being fat. And I would love to tell you that I went on this diet, I lost all the weight, and never had to diet again. Um, but <laughs> my dieting story is a lot like nearly everybody's dieting story. It starts with one diet. You lose some weight, you gain it back, and you go on another one, and another one, and another one. And over the next 24 years, I was always on a diet. Um, I did diets that were prescribed by pediatricians, nutritionists. I was on shakes. I was on diet pills. I was on diet pills that gave me the shakes. I was, <laughs> I was on every diet that you could possibly name. And in a lot of ways, I was uh, achieving at the same time. I, uh, I had always had this dream to go to NYU on a full scholarship, and I got it. And I uh, graduated summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, all that good stuff. I went to law school, a top five law school. I started practicing law for a number of years at prestigious New York City law firms. I had friends. I had boyfriends. I was achieving in a lot of ways, but on the inside, I felt like a failure because I was consumed with how much I ate, how much I didn't eat, how much I exercised, how much I didn't exercise, what I weighed yesterday, what I'm going to weigh tomorrow. And I had what I would now call scale-dependent self-esteem. And here's a little bit of what scale-dependent self-esteem looks like. So just imagine I have a scale right here. You step on the scale, you look down, and the number is going down, right? And suddenly you feel like you're on top of the world. And you walk to work, and you're feeling good. And you get to your office, and everyone's complimenting you. And they're asking, what's your secret? And you're like, my secret is this awesome diet. And everyone tells you how great you look. And there's this little tinge of anxiety. I have to admit, there's this little tinge of anxiety, because this is probably diet number 15. And you know, diets 1 through 14 started out this way and ended a different way. And so there's this tinge, but you believe. You, you have this sort of lottery thinking, and you think that this is the one, this is the answer to my weight loss dreams. OK, but here's the flip side of scale-dependent self-esteem. Let's go back to that scale. Step on the scale, you look down, and the number on the scale is up. And suddenly, things don't feel as great. And you feel ashamed. You feel like you failed. You walk to work feeling down worrying about what people are going to say when you get to the office. And usually they don't say anything, but you're not getting those compliments. You're not getting that approval anymore. And so your self-esteem is affected negatively. And here's the danger of this scale-dependent self-esteem. This is a huge danger. If you think about it, millions and millions of people are on diets at any given moment. Uh, this year alone, Americans are going to spend $62 billion on diets and diet products. So there are millions and millions of people going through this every day. And I think that this is a problem. And I want to talk about this big myth, this big myth about fat and health, which is that fat is unhealthy and weight loss is healthy. Let's talk about weight loss for just a moment. Let's talk about the realities of weight loss. So here's a statistic that I think is going to blow your minds. 95% of people who lose weight on a diet gain it back within three to five years. 
95% of people, right? This is a huge number of people who gain all of the weight back within three to five years. And you know what? 83% of people gain back more weight than they lost. So if you've ever been in that boat of losing 10 pounds, gaining 15, losing 30, gaining 60, you're not weird. You didn't fail. You're totally normal. <laughs> you're absolutely and totally normal. It's a totally normal physio physiological response. So, okay, you might be thinking, well, maybe I'll be in that 5%, right? That maybe I'll be in that 5% that keeps some weight off. Generally speaking, the majority of that 5% is keeping off four, five, six pounds. Not a lot of weight. And of course, there are those outliers. There are those people who, you know, lose a bunch of weight and keep it off past five years. But they are outliers. They are not the norm. And they're not what anybody should base their own experience on or their expectations on. Um, so if weight loss doesn't work, it doesn't work, and uh, just leads to this cycle of dieting that everyone calls yo-yo dieting, and people uh, sort of understand that yo-yo dieting is a bad thing, but really all dieting is yo-yo dieting. It really is, because it doesn't work, so you go on another diet and another diet and another diet. So if dieting doesn't work, well, you probably are thinking, well, I'm hearing all these bad things about obesity, right, and fat. Like, it's so bad to be fat. We hear about the obesity epidemic all the time and the dangers of fat. Well, I'm here to tell you that fat is not dangerous the way you think it is. Um, he, there's, there's a, there are instances in the medical literature and in, in research uh, that talk about the obesity paradox. So what is the obesity paradox? Well, it's this instance that happens again and again and again where obesity seems to have a protective effect. Uh, here are a couple of examples where obesity or fat, I like to use that word, just fat, has a protective effect. Um, one is type 2 diabetes. So people with type 2 diabetes who are fatter actually have a longer life expectancy than thinner people with type 2 diabetes, right? And what do we tell people with type 2 diabetes all the time? Well, you have to lose weight, right? You have to watch your, sh your sugar and your carbs, and you, you should do some stress reduction, but you have to lose weight. Well, we're giving people wrong information all the time. Uh, it shows up again and again. It shows up with strokes. People who are fatter who have strokes tend to heal better after stroke, have better post-stroke outcomes. Uh, people who end up in post-surgical ICU, they have a better chance of surviving and thriving after post-surgical ICU if they're fatter. And this is just a couple of instances. There are certain types of cancers where this shows up. There, there are a number of instances where this shows up. And I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that thin people should try to get fat <laughs> for their health. But I think that the point is that maybe fat and thin don't matter quite as much. Maybe they really don't matter as much as we think they do. Now here is a chart from a study that was published in uh, the American Board of Family Medicine, the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. And I want you to pay particular attention to area number four, where all the bars are kind of the same. So in this group, uh, this is uh, showing uh, normal weight people by BMI, uh, uh, overweight people by BMI, and obese people by BMI. <coughs> and what they found in this study, this is a long-term large sample study where they looked at nearly 12,000 people over an average of 14 years. So this is a big study. This is not the kind of thing you know, where they look at 50 people for three months and tell you something based on it. This is long-term, large sample study. And what they found is that people who engage with four basic healthy habits have about the same life expectancy, no matter what their size. So you take um, a 5'5", five 40-year-old, five, 135 pound woman, and you take a 5'5", five 40-year-old, five, uh, 300 pound woman, and they have the same mortality risk as long as they engage with these four basic healthy behaviors, which are very simple. These are not complicated things. These are the kind of things that people say to do all the time. And I'll tell you what they are. Um, one is not smoking. Two is moderate drinking or not drinking at all. Three is uh, eating five servings of fruits and, fruits and vegetables a day. And four is getting moderate exercise, like, like 30 minutes of walking a couple of times a week. And if you do those four basic healthy behaviors, weight really doesn't matter. It doesn't correlate to anything. 
you have the same life expectancy no matter what your size. So what does this mean, right? If, if healthy behaviors are what matters, if weight really doesn't matter, and if dieting doesn't work, what the heck are we supposed to do? How do we step into a new paradigm where we're not so focused on weight as an indicator of health, where we're thinking about healthy outcomes, where we're thinking about um, looking at people as a whole and thinking about healthy behaviors instead? Well, there's this new paradigm, pretty new, called health at every size. Um, and in my work as uh, a wellness coach, I use a health at every size model. And here's, here are the three principles of health at every size. They're really basic. So one is um, eating in a way, it basically intuitive eating, eating in a way that's aligned with your hunger and fullness signals, and uh, eating with pleasure, eating a variety of food. That's one. Two is um, finding body movement that is appropriate for your body and also pleasurable, stuff you like to do that you like moving and enjoying. And third, and perhaps my favorite, is accepting your body, understanding that there is a beautiful diversity of bodies in the world and your body fits right in there and it's perfect and fine. Um, engaging with these three principles has been shown to have better health outcomes than a diet. Um, people overall, they have more consistent self-esteem, they feel better, they uh, stay, uh, they continue to work out uh, and exercise because they're actually having fun. So this is a, a great paradigm and it's really, really been catching on. And this last part of accepting your body, accepting your body just as it is, to me, this is a, one of the greatest peace movements of our time. Because if you can let go of the judgment around your body and other people's bodies, if you can stop denigrating your own body and saying negative things about yourself, it creates an amazing sort of peace. So in preparation for my talk, I asked some of my clients and Twitter followers and Facebook fans if they would send me pictures of themselves with signs about why they embrace body love, why loving their bodies is important to them. And I received over 70 pictures from all over the world with uh, people saying why this is important to them. I just shared sharing a couple today. But so I want to ask, if I may, I want to ask you to try to engage with this process with me a little bit. And what I'd like you to do today is just have the intention, just have the intention of loving your body. You don't have to figure out what that means. You don't have to figure out how that's going to work. Just have that intention because what happens when you do that is you create a beautiful ripple effect. You create an invitation for others around you to love their bodies, to let go of judgment, to let go of all the messaging that we hear all day long about why our bodies are wrong and bad and need to change. And it creates immense peace and it creates uh, a, a beautiful feeling. So I just want you to have that intention today of loving your body, embracing body love. Thank you. <laughs>